Well, good morning. Let me invite you to take out your message notes, and if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9 this morning. And I want to say, I guess, first of all, that I am glad to be back with you. If you're new to OBC and you've been here the last couple of weeks, I may look like a complete stranger to you, but I'm actually the pastor here, okay? Uh, It's been good to be away, and we appreciate the time that we had. Christine and I were able to travel. Big, long road trip all the way to the Florida Keys and uh, the southernmost tip, I believe, of the United States and back And we still love each other and still want to be together, and I think that says a lot. Don't you think that? Uh, At the same time, we're we're really glad to be back home and and back with you guys. We miss you when we're gone. Um, We watch the services online, and and I got to say this. I appreciate our staff and our church leaders who take care of things. I don't have to worry about anything when I'm gone. I have complete confidence in everybody who is making things go back home. So thank you guys for that. Again, I'm glad to be back home. Absolutely. We appreciate we appreciate all those folks. All right. This morning, we're going to begin a new series called Unfiltered. And what we're going to do over the next four weeks is we're going to talk about four of the most surprising, controversial, um, politically incorrect things that Jesus said in the Gospels. And you may not even realize that Jesus said anything that's controversial or surprising, certainly politically incorrect, but that is far from the truth. He said things like, love your enemies. The first shall be last. He said that lust is equal to murder. When it came to his teaching, Jesus was incredibly unfiltered. Now, we ought to be able to appreciate that because we ourselves live in a very filtered world. Would you guys agree with that? Our celebrities are filtered. I mean, you almost never see a celebrity photograph anymore that hasn't been airbrushed or corrected in some way, even if if we don't recognize it. Our social media is definitely filtered. We only allow on Facebook what we want people to see And some of you haven't posted an unfiltered Instagram pic since like 2010, okay? Our our politicians are incredibly filtered. Almost nothing gets said in Washington that hasn't been filtered through 14 people first. And so all of this is why I think it's shocking to us when Jesus would say things that no one else would dare to say. He said things that absolutely blew people's minds, and he said things during his life that had literally never been said before. But here's what I think is really interesting. Jesus never made a statement just to get a reaction. His objective was always to get a response. Do you see that? Not a reaction, but a response. His goal was to get a response that would lead to transformation in the lives of people. And guess what? That is still true to this day. And that's why when we teach and preach God's word here at OBC, we always talk about application, don't we? I call it YBH. Yes, but how? Yes, we agree that that's true. But how do we apply that? How do we make that real in our life? And so as we look at these unfiltered things that Jesus said over the next few weeks, remember our goal, like Jesus, is not just a reaction. That's not what I'm trying to elicit from you, but rather a response to God's word. Now today we begin with an issue that, quite honestly, human beings have been dealing with since the very beginning of time. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden? Uh, We were at Falls Creek Uh, about a month ago, and we talked a lot at Falls Creek, the teenagers, about the Garden of Eden. You remember when Satan tempted Eve with, anybody remember what he tempted her with? Don't you remember here? (laughs) Typically, that's a pretty softball question. (laughs) An apple, right, an apple. And, and, And the Bible actually says fruit from a tree that it was a specific tree that God had told Eve do not eat from. But what the devil was really tempting her with, it wasn't just a a piece of fruit, he was really tempting her with significance, with importance. He basically said, if you think about it, Eve, God is tricking you. He doesn't want you to eat from that tree because the moment you do, he knows you will become like him. You're going to become a god 
with all of the power and the knowledge and the significance that comes with being a God. Well, guess what? Humans, you and I, we're still dealing with the very same thing today, aren't we? There is something in us that says, I want to be significant. I want to be valuable. I want to be important. Now, we may think of it in different terms. For some of us, we may think of it as a desire for respect. For others, we think of it as a desire to be recognized as the best at what we do. But all of us desire significance in our life. So then the question becomes, well, how do I measure my significance? And the answer is, of course, by competing and comparing with other people, right? Now, I'll just tell you right up front, and and I don't know if you know this about me or not, but I am one of the most competitive people you know. And I have worked really hard over the past 20 years or so to get control of that. So you may not always see that on the outside, but trust me, it is happening on the inside. Years ago, uh, our youth group discovered paintball. And they invited me to come and to play with them. We they, they, we'd built a, a course on Jimmy Hall's land. Jimmy Hall, who was then just a lowly deacon, but now is a children's pastor. And, and uh, he, had, he had acreage out there. And so they built a paintball course. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous, okay? And uh, they started playing on the weekends. And, and one day they invited me to come and, and to play with them. And I'm sure when they invited me, they probably thought, oh, the preacher, easy target, Right? Like this guy, there's no way. And so what they didn't understand is I cannot stand to lose. Okay, I I can't handle it. The first time I played, I caught Jimmy Hall sneaking down a path in front of me. And I cannot tell you the pleasure I experienced shooting him in the throat. (laughs) 43 times. That's all the paintballs that were in my gun, all right? Or I would have shot him some more. Now, look, here's the deal. Here's what I'm trying to say. There's nothing wrong with a little healthy competition. Can I, can I get an amen for that? I mean, there's nothing wrong with a little healthy competition. Unfortunately, though, we use competition in a thousand different areas of our life to help us measure our significance. Think about it. We compete in our family, don't we? We compete at school. We definitely compete or or compete in our workplace. We even compete at church. No kidding. And so we spend our lives competing in all these different areas, and then as we compete, what comes naturally next? Then we begin to compare. We compare what we drive with what other people drive. We compare what we wear. We compare how busy we are. We compare our titles, our status, what job we have. We compare our friends. We compare our children. Ever see this bumper sticker? Right? You've seen that everywhere? How about this one? This one's even better. Yeah. Little healthy competition, never hurt anybody. Have you thought about how much of our lives are actually spent comparing ourselves against other people. And it comes from this desire to measure our significance. Now again, that in and of itself, it might not be too bad, but unfortunately, we have to take it a step further. See, it's not good enough for us just to compete with others. It's not good enough to simply compare against others. There is something in us that desires to put other people down so that we can feel what? Lift it up, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. Well, I may not drive a Lexus, but at least I don't drive a Ford. Paul drives a Ford, by the way. At least, at least my child, I don't drive a Lexus in case someone was confused about that. At least my child gets to play in every game, not just sit on the bench like, like hers does. Look at that. They don't even know where Lamentations is found in the Bible. By the way, nobody knows where Lamentations is found in the Bible, okay? See, what we do as humans, we will put other people down so that we feel lifted up, so that we feel valuable, so that we feel important, so that we feel significant. 
And so this morning, we're going to ask ourselves three questions in response to something Jesus said about our search for significance in Mark chapter 9. And, and here's the first one, and I really want to encourage you to write this in. If you are inclined towards taking notes, I want to ask you to, to try to answer these questions. Here's number one. Is it possible that we are looking in the wrong places for significance? Well, you guys consider that question. Is it possible that we are looking in our lives in the wrong places for significance? Now, before I read to you from Mark 9, we're going to read what he says. Let me give you a little bit of context. I think it's going to be important. Israel at this time, when Jesus spoke these words, Israel was under Roman rule. Before that, it was Persia. Before that, it was the Babylonian Empire. Before that, it was Assyria. Before that, it was Egypt. There's this long history of the kingdom of Israel being ruled and occupied by other nations. And for all of this time, all of the Old Testament, Israel is banking on this Old Testament prophecy that says God is going to send a Messiah, a heavenly king from the line of David to restore Israel's power and prominence and significance. And so into that environment of great expectation comes Jesus doing miracles, healing people, teaching these amazing truths and saying that all these things are evidence that the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, when Jesus said kingdom of God, the Jews heard kingdom of Israel. And that means that we're going to wipe away Rome, we're going to get our wealth back, we're going to get our power back. And when the disciples specifically heard Jesus talking about a throne, they thought, oh boy, because we're part of Jesus' inner circle, that means we're going to be the advisors, we're going to be the generals. They were excited about the kingdom of God, but they didn't understand it. They also thought whichever one of us is closest to Jesus, when this thing goes down, is going to be the greatest beneficiary to everything the kingdom has to offer. And so they began to do what we have a tendency sometimes to do. They began to compete, and they began to rank, and they began to compare, and they began to argue about who was Jesus' favorite, all because they wanted the rewards of significance. Now, meanwhile, Jesus knows that they're missing the whole point. He knows that they're thinking earthly kingdom. They're thinking earthly king. And you, you can't really blame them, can we? That's the only context that they had ever known. And so Jesus has tried to explain to them, I'm not talking about a kingdom on earth. I'm talking about a kingdom in heaven, a kingdom that will actually last forever. Because you see, I'm not a king that's going to set up a throne on earth to gain power and wealth so that I can by force rule over other nations. That's not what I'm about. I'm the kind of king that will give my life away. Because in giving my life away, I will influence more people into my kingdom than if I used my throne and my power to force people to follow me. This is what he was trying to explain to them. The disciples, however, were not getting the memo. They are now, at this point, they are constantly arguing about who's going to be the greatest. So here's what Jesus says to them in Mark chapter 9. With all that as background... Listen to this, Mark 9, 35. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. In other words, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. Now, would you agree with me? That is not exactly the way the world normally looks at it, is it? I mean, that's just not the worldly view. In fact, the worldview is very much the opposite of that. As the great philosopher Ricky Bobby once said, if you ain't first, anybody? You're last, right? I mean, that, exactly, that's exactly right. But Jesus suggests a completely different approach. He says, look, I know what you're doing. He says, you're looking for a place of power. You're looking for a place of significance. You're looking for a place of authority. But here's what you don't understand, guys. He says significance is not found in position. It's actually found in service. He says, you want to be first in my kingdom? 
You're not going to get there through anything this world has to offer. The path that you're going to have to take is being actually a servant. It's giving your life away so that other people can find me. It's not about how many people serve you. It's about how many people you serve that makes you significant in my eyes. Now, let me just let me clarify something before we go on. Because I, I, I've learned over the years, I've been doing this for a while, and there are moments where I know I'm about to get some emails, okay? I know that I'm about to get some texts. So let me just let me just preemptively say this to save you the, the typing time, all right? I want to clarify, Jesus never said it was wrong to achieve. Jesus never said it was wrong to be successful, okay? In fact, all the way from the very beginning when God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create them and say, hey, you know what, guys, just hang out and, and just, just be lazy. Just, just sit around the garden and just enjoy things. You know, just watch the world pass you by. No, what did God actually give to Adam and Eve? He gave them responsibilities, did he not? He gave them a job to do. He, here's the deal. You, I, we have been designed to achieve. We have been designed to work. We have been designed to accomplish things. And that's why when we're not achieving, when we're not working, when we're not accomplishing things, we're typically not very happy, are we? Sometimes we can't figure it out why. It's because we were made to do those things. But here's the other thing. Significance is also not found in achievement. It's found in our relationship with God. You see, God never designed success to satisfy us. Listen, that's so important. Let me say that again. And I pray that that, that would sink in for some of us. God never designed success to satisfy us. Achievement is not a sin, but achievement was not designed to satisfy what is missing inside of us. Now, what God did design to fulfill us is a relationship with him that was only made possible because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so this is why Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be last. And the only way to do that is through your relationship with me. Now, how many of you have a dog? I'm not talking to cat people. I'm not even interested in cat people, okay? Raise your hand if you have a dog. All right, very good. Are, are there times, dog people, let me ask you this. Are there ever times when you could swear that your dog knows exactly what you're saying? You know what I'm talking about? Like you, you're talking to them and they're just, they're right there with you. And then are there times where you really need them to understand you and they look at you just like this? <laughs> right? Like, huh? I have this really strange feeling that is exactly what the disciples were looking like as Jesus was trying to explain this to them. So Jesus, here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't just look down on them. You know, he doesn't just get frustrated. I would get so frustrated with them. But instead, he's like, okay, they're not getting it. They're not getting it. Let me simplify it. What's the best way to simplify it? It's almost always an object lesson, right? You can't get the concept. Let me show you something physical that would that kind of help you make sense of this. So listen to this in verse 36. Jesus took a little child. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate object lesson. He took a little child whom he placed among them, taking the child in his arms. So he puts him down, and then he picks the child up, and he says to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So let, let's think about this again. He takes the, the, little, the little kid that's there among them. He picks him up. He holds him in his arms. And he basically says, when you love a child like this, you're loving me. But even better than that, you're loving the one who sent me, which of course is God, right? So you're loving me. You're loving God. Now, actually, I, I think it's kind of hard for us to get our head around this part because we read that. And we think, well, big deal. I, I, I love kids, right? I mean, that's, that's not hard to understand. That's not a problem. And the reason we feel that way is because in our culture, 
we value children, yes? So if I, if I brought a child down here to the front and I said, okay, anybody in this room who would, would is there anybody who would come up here and love on this child and, and in doing so would show love to God? Who will do that? We would have people flood down to the front, would we not? I mean, there'd be tons of people who would come down and, and, and they would do that. Why? Because we love children. They are valuable. They are precious to us. But I need you to understand something. This was not the case in first century Palestine. Understand, Jesus is not talking to a group of men who would typically say, oh, I love children. I mean, I love children. No. He's talking to a group of people who live in a culture where they didn't see children as precious and sweet and adorable. You know what they saw them as? They saw children as property. In fact, under Roman law, it was legal for a father, if he did not want a child, to take the child and put them outside. See, typically when a child was born, he would be laid at the feet of the father. Probably the reason Jesus took this child and set him in front of them and then picked him up. It's kind of weird, like why would he do that? Well, in the Roman world, a baby would be placed at the father's feet. If the father reached down and picked him up, then that child would be welcomed into the family. But if the father turned his back, the child would be, and this is an ancient reference, would be put outside. If you were a female, you actually had a very good chance of being put outside. If you had any kind of deformity or handicap, you know what happened to you? Chances were very, very good you would be put outside. And by put outside, I mean that an infant would be left to die in the elements. Sometimes it was even worse than that. In 1885, archaeologists discovered a letter written by the Roman statesman Seneca, which included these words. He said, We slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad dog, we punch a knife into the sickest cattle, children who are born weak and deformed, we drown. So you understand this was a culture that looked at children very different. You, you, are you with me on this? Now, I'm describing what was allowed in the Roman culture, but the Jewish culture was different from ours as well. A boy had absolutely no status whatsoever until they turned 13 years old. And a girl had no status until she was married. And even then, it wasn't honestly much of a status. So try to understand their shock, those who were listening, when Jesus picks up this little child and says, this little person who has no status, who has no standing, who has no value that you don't even think of as a person yet, that, does that sound familiar to you in any way in our culture today? There is a connection there, isn't there? But this, this person who in our culture sees no value in reality is so valuable to God that to love this child and to treat them like an equal is to love God himself. You think that wasn't a shocker? I mean, remember, this was a culture where the more wealth you have, the more power you had, the more religious standing you enjoyed, the closer to God you were considered. And the opposite was also true. The less wealth and power and status you had, the further from God you were. So when Jesus says that to love a lowly child is to love God himself, he not only says something that had never been said before, he blows up their entire religious system that they were counting on to get to God. And let me tell you from experience People do not like you messing with their religious system, okay? I have personal experience in this area. And so Jesus tells the disciples, he says, guys, you are completely off track in the way that you're thinking. Your priorities are completely messed up. He says, you're spending every day trying to figure out how you can get ahead and be successful and be important, and meanwhile, you're ignoring and missing the very kinds of people that God is most concerned for. Now, what about us? 
Because it's easy to point our finger at the disciples, right? But what about us? Is there any of the disciples' arrogance or misguidedness in us? Is it possible, here's question number two, is it possible that we are missing someone or something that is truly important in our quest to be somebody? I want you to think about it. Who are you walking past every day that has no idea they're valuable to God? But you're too busy keeping your eye on the prize to notice it or to do anything about it. Who in my life is under my authority and and I kind of let them know that they're beneath me, that they're not as important as I am? And I'd never admit it, and you would never admit it, but it feels kind of good to put them in their place every once in a while, doesn't it? Who are you missing, overlooking, ignoring in your life because you're too busy searching for your own significance? A neighbor? A family member? Somebody at the office? Somebody on your volleyball team or at the locker next to you? The guy who mows your lawn? And what would it cost you to serve whoever it is that you might be overlooking or missing in your life. Now, I talked about the importance of application earlier. Yes, but how? So let's just be as practical as we possibly can be. Valuing someone means giving both our time and our attention. You guys agree with that? Valuing someone means giving both our time and our attention. And remember, one is really no good without the other, is it? You don't call somebody up that you know needs your help and say, hey, I care about you. You are valuable to me. I want to help you any way I possibly can. And by the way, I got two minutes to talk. All right, you're going to need to make it snappy because I got other stuff to do. You know what? Some issues just cannot be fixed in two minutes, can they? Maybe, maybe we need to make a bigger investment than that. Maybe we need to take them out to lunch. Maybe we need to find a way to build a relationship. Maybe instead of a text message, it's a phone call. Maybe instead of an email, it's a face-to-face conversation. We have to be careful of giving our attention, but not our time. We also have to be careful about giving people our time, but not our attention. There is nothing more devaluing than being in a conversation with somebody, and they keep checking their cell phone, right? I mean, we we hate that when people do that to us. Well, guess what? If we truly value someone, we'll give them both our time and our attention. And so Jesus says, make sure you're not looking in the wrong place for significance. And make sure you're not missing the people around you that God is most concerned with. Okay? Now, with all of that said, you would think that at this point, the disciples would have this big emotional moment where they beg Jesus for forgiveness, right? Where they're like, oh, Lord, I mean, what were we thinking? Of course, we're completely off track. We're, we're going to recommit our lives to, to serving you, God. And, and they would like pass out candy to all the little children, right? Something like that. You would think that would be their response. Truth is, they didn't get it. One chapter later, you know what they're doing? Listen to this, Mark chapter 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw them, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on them. And he blessed them. It's like, guys, come on. Are you kidding me? But it gets even worse. Same chapter, just a few days later, verse 35 through 38, and then 43 through 45. Listen to this. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Sounds like one of my staff members. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. 
He says, you don't even know what you're asking. Verse 43, for whoever wants to be, become great among you must be your servant, and, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It, it just did not sink in, did it? It just wasn't sinking in. This perspective on significance was so ingrained, enmeshed in their minds and their way of life that it took a crisis of belief to shock their system and wake them up to the reality of what Jesus was trying to show them. For some of them, it was seeing Jesus crucified on a cross that woke them up. For others... It was the sight of an empty tomb that made them understand. For some, it was seeing the resurrected Jesus face to face, touching the holes in his hands and his side where he'd been pierced. And for others, it wasn't until a crowd of people picked up stones and began to beat them to death that they really understood what it means to be, to, for the first to be last and the least to become the greatest. Let me ask you a question. I'm asking you a question. Have you ever experienced a crisis of belief? And I'm not talking about a moment where you struggled with believing in God, but a moment that shocked you into opening your eyes and seeing things for what they really were. Maybe it was a moment in your career where you realized, you know, I've been climbing this ladder for 40 years now. And I've realized it was leaned against the wrong wall the whole time. Maybe it was when your kids graduated high school or college or got married and you realized this is, this is really it. They're no longer children. They're grown. They're gone. And you thought to yourself, did I, did I miss out on years with them that I can never get back? Because I was too focused on other things I thought were more important. Maybe it was when someone close to you passed away. And you had to reevaluate your priorities. And begin to really reconsider what's most important in your life. Folks, we've got to make sure we're not looking for significance in the wrong places. And the wrong things that we're not devaluing the people who should be the most valuable to us and the most valuable to God. Because if we don't, we will spend every day for the rest of our lives chasing after the next deal or the next trophy or the next status symbol that we think will make us feel important, respected, appreciated, and significant. But listen to me, listen to me. It won't work. None of that stuff will fulfill us the way we think it will. Parents, none of that stuff will fulfill your children like you hope that it will. You know, I think that's actually the most ironic thing about this passage. The disciples were looking to be great, so they were competing and ranking and comparing, but here's the ironic thing. They were already great. Think about it. The disciples were looking to be great. They were already in the midst of greatness. Their pastor was Jesus Christ. They were doing life with the king of kings. And they still didn't get it. So let me ask you this as a Christian. Is it possible that we are wasting time looking for something we already have? Is it possible we're wasting time looking for something we already have that, that as Christians we could spend our whole lives searching and grabbing and maneuvering and working? I've got to be somebody. I want to be significant. I've got to be the best only to discover we were looking for something we already had. Christians, do you know what the cross says over you? The cross says you are significant. Think about that for a second. 
you are significant. The cross says you are not ranked. You are ransomed. You were rescued. You are completely valuable. And that value does not fluctuate. The cross says your significance is fixed at its highest possible level and that it will never, ever change. Do you realize that? Now, maybe you're here today and you're not getting the honor or respect that you feel like you want, that you feel like you need. Maybe you're feeling that you're just not worth very much. Maybe it's related to your job. Or maybe it's the season of life you're in. Maybe you're single. Maybe you've been trying to have kids and, and you haven't been able to. There are so many places the world tells us to look for our significance in. But here's what you need to know. There is a God in heaven who gave his life for you. And he did it because you are incredibly significant to him. If you will recognize your need for a Savior and put your trust in him to save you, you become an heir to the throne of God and you become an adopted son or daughter of the king. If that's not something that you've ever thought about, I want to challenge you to think about it. Christian, what do you say we stop looking to the things of this world for our significance? What do you say? When Jesus died on the cross, he proved once and for all just how much you mean to him and how much he loves you. So let's take that love and let's bask in it. Let's find our joy. Let's find our satisfaction and our peace and our strength in that. And then let's do the most godly thing we could ever do. Let's take all of that and let's give it away. Let's give it away by loving unlovely people, encouraging discouraged people, valuing devalued people. That is where we not only find, that's where we share significance with the world. Heavenly Father, Many of us, we've heard these verses a thousand times. The first shall be last, and, and that you didn't come to be served, but to serve, God. We, we've heard these verses. But maybe for the first time this morning, we could realize and understand exactly what it is you were trying to say, not only to your disciples, but to us today. We're looking for significance in places we're never going to find it. Our true significance is only in our relationship with you, God. And you've already settled it. You've already settled how much you love us. You've already settled how valuable we are to you. So God, if, if there's a person here this morning who doesn't yet realize just how much you love them and what you've done for them in sending Jesus to die in their place, Father, I pray that maybe this message this morning would plant a seed in their heart. That you would begin to water that seed and cultivate that seed. It might grow into a question. What would it take for me to become a child of the King? Father, I pray for Christians. We have a bad, bad, bad habit of reading Scripture and thinking it applies to everybody but ourselves. And God, what we've been talking about this morning, we know it's true of us. We are on a search for significance. But God, we already have it. It's in you. It's in our salvation. So God, will you help us to see we're not gonna fill any holes with anything this world has to offer. We're only gonna fill holes through our relationship with you by serving others and following your example. God, help us to see this. I don't know what application looks like for every individual in this room, God, but I pray that during our invitation time right now, our response time right now, 
that every one of us would really stop and think about what application looks like for us. Help us to do that, God. Help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.